All right, everyone? Okay, a bit long in the day. Trying to keep energy up. All right, so uh, high energy pipeline talk. <laughs> hey. So um, what kind of pipeline can you do without coding? Uh, long, well, the short answer is not that much. But you don't actually need that much to get a major benefit. And that's what this talk is about. So who is telling you this? Uh, uh, me, I am Ryan Fuller. I am a, um, I used to work as an ATD at DNEG. Uh, I am currently a pipeline developer at Jellyfish Pictures. Um, I'm a hobbyist animator. Uh, I'm a long-term Blender user. Uh, so long-term, in fact, I remember uh, this. And uh, I also remember how I used to make projects. So uh, I would do a tutorial. Uh, I would save everything into one massive Blender file. Uh, I would save those files wherever I liked, under whatever name I fancied at the time. Uh, I would duplicate whatever I needed wherever I wanted. Uh, I would hide everything underground when I didn't need it. Um, I would have very inconsistent asset quality. That's meant to be a, um, a clock and a typewriter. Uh, you could decide which one that's referring to. Uh, it would slow my machine down to a crawl. Uh, it would take extremely long times to render and be very noisy. And uh, this took way, way too long to make. So uh, a lot of talks have been going on the premise of building the tracks as you're going. This was like uh, pushing a train across a road and saying, wow, it wouldn't be nice if we had tracks. Uh, and the, yeah, the, you can see the sort of year and a half it took to finish this. And this is, a, uh, this is the viewport from a real project that I did uh, complete. And this is everything all on show as it happens. Uh, I did this quite a while ago. Now this was in old Blender. Um, everything like effects and uh, empties were just left around. Uh, if, if it, uh, that by, I just shot the rest of the shots uh, tastefully to avoid actually showing that and fixing it. And so I, I call this sort of the brute force approach, which is very fun and creative. Uh, and so it gets you in the zone. You don't really want to get rid of this aspect of it. Uh, it's, it's good for very small projects. So if you're doing like a few seconds of animation or a logo, uh, then most of these issues don't really matter. Um, but it does uh, slow down production a lot if you're trying to scale it up, especially if you keep it being dis uh, disorganized. Um, it puts a lot of ownership on the individual. So if you try and work with other people to help speed things up, it ends up being harder because you have everything in your head and you can't get it out as easily. And no one can understand what cube 23 is doing or what it's meant to do. Um, but it doesn't take a lot to make this way better. So let's have a go at this. So making a pipeline. Uh, a pipeline can be many different things in many different places. The definition I'm going to go with is it's uh, just a system of rules and procedures that helps organize the flow of work. And so it, that just means deciding what work to do in what order. Uh, so let's, let's try and do that. Uh, so there, there are a bunch of really good solutions for pipelining that come with built-in Blender support, which are really great. And this is not a, to replace those. Uh, these tools usually have a lot of pre-made uh, assumptions that you know what pipelines are doing anyway. So I think it's uh, a good way to see if we can make a bare minimum, bare bones uh, pipeline and see where that goes. And it helps learn as well. So we have our problems, uh, very long production times, uh, inability to find files, um, messy scene habits making it difficult to work with, uh, slow scene performance making it uh, difficult to do things we're trying to do in that slow performance, uh, inconsistent quality, and being dependent on one person with everything just being in their head, mainly my head. And we can address these by uh, planning what we want to make first and dedicating some time to experiment at the beginning, uh, figuring out a naming scheme for files and folders so it's self-explanatory. If people are coming into this, they can figure out where things are. Uh, splitting up the files so that not everything is in one massive file. Uh, keep only what's needed in a scene, making some bases to work off of and making a list of things that we want to 
do as standards before diving in and staggering out the work into steps. So let's try and do this with the example project. Uh, a jam sandwich. So this is a project which is the step zero of any project is inspiration. Uh, this is a example project of a, a, a guy getting hungry, going to make a sandwich, eating it. The sandwich has jam in it. And so this is going to help decide what pipeline we're going to make and how it, we make it. Uh, and so the, the very first thing, uh, besides references, of course, uh, is the storyboard. So we want to plan what we want to make before we do it. So uh, a good way to do that would be a storyboard. And this is not just a like fancy uh, make an elaborate whole film before you make the whole film again. This is an extremely just bare bones, get the idea out. It's a way of communicating your idea to yourself and others. So it's not meant to be pretty. Um, that's a real storyboard for Knives Out. And that's someone who made Star Wars in ASCII art. Uh, so a generic pipeline gives generic improvements. So we don't know what we need unless we know what we're going to make first. Uh, and with storyboards, you'll be able to work out stuff later on. So this is uh, me taking six minutes to try, try out a storyboard. I knew roughly what I was going to make beforehand, but this is just me solidifying it. It gives you, it gives you a way of figuring out angles, composition, all that arty stuff, but more pipeline -y related in a second. And yeah, that's it. And then now, once we have the storyboard, we can make an animatic. And again, this could all just be done in Blender. Uh, this is just those same storyboard images in time. So it gives you a way of figuring out the timing of things artistically as well, quite relevant. But pipeline oriented, uh, it gives us a few details. So we can figure out some details for the animatic. So we know roughly how long it's going to be. And we could get an idea of how complex it is. So characters, assets, props, uh, use of jam. And it give, we could also figure out if there's anything unusual to focus on. So if we have a big crowd in the background at something that needs to all weave past a fluid sim, we know that's going to be tricky. So we can figure out and prepare for that. So to actually make use of the animatic, we can start splitting it up. So we know how to chunk out the work. But it could be that you want to just put it all into one file, but this, this will help move that around. So if we take Radomatic and uh, export it as an MP4, render it, open it into another Blender scene, just, this is just the editing uh, tracks, and we can just start splitting it up. So it might seem sensible to just evenly split it up into 10 second chunks, but we can also take advantage of uh, some pre-established terminology. So um, in standard uh, VFX productions, they'll use some ways of defining what parts are of a show. So in case no one here has heard of these before, we'll, I'll quickly go over them. So in general, um, if you have a show, which could just refer to a movie, a TV show, uh, a short film, all of them could just be called shows, uh, they can be split up into episodes. So you could say an episode is a change in story. Or if you're not doing episodes, you could just be have a whole movie and then that'll just be the whole show. So it's like splitting up a, a street into different houses. And then within each uh, episode or show, you could say every time the background or setting changes, that's a change in location or a change in shot, uh, or sorry, a change in set. And this could be like an altercation in the story as well. It could be different arcs, it could be different acts, whatever you want to do. Uh, and this could be like splitting a house into different floors. And then within each of those sequences, we could say that every time a change in the camera happens, it's a change in the cut, which could be considered a shot. And this is just the smallest part you can break a film or show into. And that's uh, a good measurement we could use. And the goal of the uh, storyboard is to get to the point where you can make a list of shots to distribute the work into. Uh, so it would be a bit, well, it'd be a bit easy to just go shot one, shot two, shot three, that's all the shots, until you get to shot 3081. But we can also name these shots with uh, some naming schemes. So this is, um, well, if we're boiling down pipelines, uh, pipelines are just naming schemes. 
And if this is the one thing you take away from this talk that's brand new to you, then let it be this. So naming schemes, um, first thing to do, uh, we're going to pick the name of our show and shorten it to be three or four characters long uh, because you're going to be writing it a lot. Uh, it'll take over your life. So having it short as possible uh, helps enormously. So stuff like Macbeth will become MCB. Uh, Midsummer Night Stream, you could just abbreviate it as well, just MND. Uh, and with Jam, easy, Jam. Uh, and now we can look at the number of sequences. So we have uh, our animatic. We can roughly go along there and see how many sequences we have, uh, every change in set or story. And this, you can count these up. So for this animation, I counted roughly three sequences. There's getting hungry, standing up to make the sandwich, and then eating it. And this is one digit. So that's, we can express all of the different sequences in one digit. So let's add one more digit, because I'll bring up something later on that will help. But that gives us two digits total to contain all of the numbers of sequences. And the number of shots. So I've counted uh, the maximum shots we have per sequence. And so that's about six. So that means still one digit. But with shots, uh, we might be editing stuff around as we go along. So we might want to insert things. We might want to make more of them. Uh, we want to have extra digits for safety. So we want to add the one from before for a reason I'll explain in a second. And another one just for safety. So that gives us three digits, three digits to work with. And now we have uh, three um, tokens, is what they would be called. Uh, we can now insert them into a naming scheme. And this is a way of saying these values go wherever we want in the name. So this could express the whole shop name. So if we have those three tokens, we could say show name, sequence number, shot number. And this will define the smallest part of our show, which is the shop. And you can also take away the last three digits, and that'll be a sequence name. And that's, that's it. And then you, to actually use this, we can uh, make use of a coding convention, which is to always count in tens. So if you're counting in tens, that means you have numbers in between that you can insert into. into. So uh, if we start counting in tens, that means that the first sequence is sh sequence 10, and the first shot is shot 10. So that would be the whole first shot name. And the second would be uh, sequence 10, shot 20. And then the, the, the new sequence would be uh, sequence 20, shot 10. And so if you ever need to add a shot in between these two, you could just use uh, a five. So count up in fives, and that'll be as, uh, inserts itself automatically. So you could have that be on a, um, an edit, or if you're just making a new one, then everyone knows where it goes. Uh, and then same thing with sequence names. So if you have the just the first two tokens, that's the sequence name, and you can make a new sequence, put in a five. And this, this just, that's the whole magic system. Everything else will just peg itself onto these names. So if we name stuff like this, then we could say every single thing we have res is responsible for that part of the show. Uh, yeah. And so this gives you a major benefit of a stop, stuff like just naming it shot one, shot two, the shot where the man gets shot, uh, so, for instance, the, every operating system will sort name, if you sort it chronologically uh, or alphabetically, you'll get chronological order automatically. So this will mean that every, anywhere you are, you can see what sequence you're in and see it in order, so you know roughly where it is on the show. And you can also, if you're working at all, you can navigate them easily. So if you have, uh, we'll get to file naming in a second, but the file name itself will be able to express everything it is. and when you're going through all of those files, they'll all be the same length, they'll all be the same uh, level of detail, and you can tell roughly where they are in the project when you're going to them. And uh, yeah, the, the code in front is just always a nice indicator. So the downside of shots is that now we have to be careful about continuity. So if uh, an object disappears and reappears between shots, then that's a bit of an issue. But we can figure a way out of that with uh, something else later. So back to the animatic. We can now use the uh, uh, editor to cut up wherever there's a continuous camera angle change, and we can figure out where there's different sequences as well. So if you use a marker or you could use uh, strip groups, uh, grouping works in the graph editor as well. It's a bit 
uh, different, but it, it helps. And we can now get our full list of shots. And uh, that's, that's it. So we have, the, we have the full shot list. So now let's check out how many assets we're going to need. So we're splitting it up into shots and assets. So I just wrote down, based on uh, what I saw in these sh shots, all of the different uh, assets that I thought we'd need. And I'm not like, going granular like the socks on the character, because we don't want to go that too deep too quickly. If we want to add things later, we can. Only get the things that either a character interacts with, uh, is, it co uh, is vital for composition, or is a set. That, and you don't want to go too uh, granular too quickly. And yeah, now we have our list of assets. So I've sort of grouped these roughly by what, what props or sets of characters they are, but these, this grouping will become in handy later on as well. But right now, it'd be confusing if we had, say, uh, jam refer to multiple different things. So be clear if you're going to name an asset that it, say, jam jar, a jam knife, or uh, a jam character, because you have a character called knife, and you'd be confused when you import that into your scene. So now we have the shot names and the asset names. Uh, well, we don't actually have the asset names yet because they are not formatted. They've got spaces, horrible spaces. We don't like spaces. So let's go with the one token uh, per piece of information thing. So we have the name here. That's not good. It has spaces. So let's try putting underscores in it. That's all right, but it's also meaning that the whole asset name is split across uh, an underscore. And we've already established that an underscore splits one token, and one token is one piece of information. So let's try camel case. That's getting there, but let's do uh, full capital, um, then camel case, meaning that we now have a way of differentiating this from, say, a different word that's lowercase. Oh, and uh, if you, um, fun fact, is that Maya cannot have numbers at the beginning of our file names, um, just, just in case that's relevant. And now, we can look at the assets that we have, and we've got a list of them, and now we can categorize them. So if you want to have, if you have a different show with lots of effects, you might want to have effects as a category, you'd have an asset for all of those different things, but right now I'm just categorizing it in the main ones for us, so sets, props, and characters. Characters are just anything with a rig. Props are anything that is interacted with, or is it the background as dressing, and then a set is just a room. You could have vehicles, you could have set dressing as a different category. Um, yeah, that, that's, um, that's a good way of keeping things organized as well. And then now we can get on to folder structure. So we'll get, we'll get to Blender soon. Uh, but folder structure, we want places to store assets, shots, and other files. So for now, we'll have these three main um, root files. So, so yeah, so we have the first file folder, which is the show name. And then we'll have assets, sequences, and pre-production. And these are very broad root places to just keep those things stored. So uh, the pre-production would be mostly for like the edit, the uh, storyboards, the animatic, those things you already have, but we haven't saved yet. And then, yeah, so within, within this assets folder we've just made, we can now split this up by the asset type we've had earlier. And then now this means that you can navigate based on type. And then once you have those, we can now actually start putting the actual uh, asset folders. And this is just setting us up for later and making sure those are capitals and that those are not. That's another right reason why they're not capitalized is because we want to make sure there's a difference between an asset name and something just for labeling. So back in sequences, uh, we could do the same thing we did up for our shots. So we list out all the sequences we need. And then within those, we list all the shots we need. And these are all self-explanatory as well. And you also get that handy timeline order as well. So to review, this is what it looks like in uh, the OS. It's Windows, I know, sorry. And uh, while we're at it, we can also uh, make a, a file just at the root just to keep some settings in. So these are things that would apply to the whole show. Uh, yeah, so like those sort of things which can contain uh, stuff, for instance, uh, locking your version. So if you don't currently lock your version, then there's a high chance you'll get uh, feature creep or you'll try to go, oh, there's something new in the new version. Let's, let's try and use that. Try to avoid that if you're going into a project for a long time. 
Uh, in this case, I'm using 3.5.1, so I've not installed the newest one. Uh, it's taking all my willpower not to. And uh, we can uh, then we can have like other things. So, uh, oh yeah, this also means that you could take advantage of the um, long-term uh, a long-term support version. So this is what those are for. You get bug fixes, but you don't get new flashy changes. Uh, you could also set your scale. So if you want to have a character uh, match the world size, so a Blender, one unit is one meter. In other tools, one unit is one millimeter, one centimeter. So if you are importing other things outside of your project, make sure that the scale matches that just before you import it, because then you could have a, you might in case have a system where you bring it in and it's too big. Uh, resolution FPS. This may seem silly, but there's uh, a lot of companies that fail to do this that I've seen professionally. Uh, and then color space, uh, Blender's got a really good decent one. You can pick one for yourself as well, but this is the kind of place it would go. Uh, stuff that would apply to the whole show, not to anything specific, but because those all can change. So let's uh, go, if you go back to the bit at the beginning where I said we want to keep the free form uh, experimental part of Blender usage, this is where it goes. We can now develop a look, which is what look dev means. So we can finally open Blender and start figuring out the main parts of the show, namely the jam. And that's, that's mostly the uh, tricky part, is I wanted to make sure that the jam looked good, uh, apply heavy use of references. Uh, this is why it's called look development. Uh, you decide stuff like the render engine, the render settings, the resolution, the general art style. And you could just have fun. You could do some tutorials. You can experiment, throw stuff away, keep it messy, no naming schemes, no nothing. This is the place to put it. Uh, controlled chaos. And uh, so yeah, I wanted to make sure that I had the jam material right. I experimented, I found that uh, just doing an add shader, which always works. And uh, I knew I was going to use Eevee just so I had to get quick render times. So I'm immediately benefiting from this step. So it means that now I've got that out of the way, I can put that into all the other places. So let's, let's save it. So that was the look dev file. Let's now actually save it. So we've got the basic folder structure, so uh, assets and shots. We know what those contain. They contain parts that are relevant to that asset or that shot. But within those folders, we want to put in more folders because we don't want to have a mix of many file types in one place. We want to have a single file relevant to a single folder. And, and that, there's many reasons for that, most of which comes down to if your naming scheme matches the same file, then you get the same extension. And some operating system and some software don't recognize the different uh, extensions. And so, but it, it also is, makes it easier to organize and see more clearly what it is. Uh, so for these right now, we've got scenes, renders, textures, caches. Uh, you could have effects, uh, you might have sound. Sound I'll come on to later as well. Uh, but scenes is where you'd put the blender scenes, uh, renders for any output renders. And so for the name of the file itself, we know that the look dev applies to a general whole show. We don't, it doesn't really apply to a specific shot because we're developing a look. So we can't go in a shot folder and it's not really something that responds to a sequence either because it's the whole show. But that means we can now just use that part of the name, which is the whole show. So then uh, the, so the first token will always apply to the part of the show it relates to, asset, shot, show. Oh, and uh, another benefit of naming it like this is if you're working on multiple shows at once, you don't get confused about which show you're in. So the second part would be the kind of work we're doing, so look dev, so like naming the stage of work, and then this thing on the right, which I will also come to in a second, and uh, lowercase, just so it doesn't match, uh, clash with any asset names that you might be calling look dev for whatever reason, and uh, bam, a name. And that's now the name we can use to save a file. So within pre-production look dev scenes. So now we can start saving the other uh, files. So animatic, that's a scene, so we could call it animatic. Uh, the renders, that will go into the ad adjacent render folders. And uh, yeah, the BL proxy will just be there. You can uh, disable that or turn it off or just delete it afterwards. Uh, the edit, that was the bit where we cut up the animatic. That is just the same scenes folder. And uh, same for the storyboard. So that, that little bit on the end where it says V001, that is a version token, and that is for if you have second thoughts. So the way most you can version anything is, a, is um, by two different methods. 
uh, source control and version control. Uh, source control is like tracking all of the differences, which this is an actual excerpt from the script for this talk. And this will track all of the changes from a starting point, which is very good and convenient for code because you can see what's changed between versions. But it's very hard for larger complex files, especially files that reference other files. That's just a nightmare. So we don't want to do that. We want to do version control, which is where you make an entire complete new version every single time and you give it a new version number. And you just make this number higher as you go along. And the great thing with this is that it gives you uh, the ability to make changes, save new things, but maintain the old one. And this was where you might use an external system like uh, Excel or a spreadsheet to track which versions are good or which versions are bad or which versions contain what in them. Uh, but for this project, we can generally just say latest is greatest. Uh, never assume this for a big production. And uh, the way you could use, uh, or the way, the way we work on a, a file is to save it, uh, label it version one, and then we can make any tiny adjustments we want while we're still saving. Like you don't have to make every different tiny thing a new version. Uh, but the next day you want to do a larger change, you want to do some slight modeling, uh, you make a version two. And then if you want to add materials or textures, make a version three. And then if you want to start something entirely new, make a new version again. The more successful you are at maintaining a, a version history and a versioning system, uh, the more sex, success, uh, successful you will be in working in parallel. Oh, and uh, yeah, since we're at, while we're at it, um, turn off Blend 1 files. This means you don't really need to worry about that. So quick review. Uh, these are the things we've done. Uh, the time isn't proportional. The rest of the thing will be hopefully covered quite quickly. So uh, let's dive into assets. So now we want to make assets. We could just do it one by one, but that's quite repetitive. So we can speed it up a little by making a base scene. So in a lot of places, this will be called a shot build or a um, hot build or something like that. And this is where you would start uh, making a file that has everything you need to start working. So we could do stuff like open a Blender scene, give it some specific viewport lighting. So it means that all of your assets have the same lighting between them and you know what they're going to look like in context. If they're all consistent with each other, then they should all be consistent with any lighting you change in the scene itself. Uh, you can make pre-made collections to organize stuff. Um, you can have all the rendering settings set up, all of the se uh, settings you found in a look dev, uh, and uh, always enable all of these restriction toggles, because I never, ever not open a file and not want to set these. And yeah, save it. And you call it, uh, you will give it a new folder. We'll call it a base, because that's sort of a new category of thing we want. And this can apply to all assets. It can apply to, to a type of asset. It can apply to wherever you want, well, based on the folder structure. So when you want to make a new asset, you open this file, save as, start working. So uh, when you want to start making assets, I suggest starting with a character, because this helps give a consistent scale, help gives a look for a feel and style. Um, if you go, it's also the most complex thing, so you want to get out of the way quickly. So uh, don't be afraid if it takes a few tries. Uh, we also know that because it's got multiple rigs and multiple objects, uh, we can adopt a pseudo naming scheme for that, so just try and be neat. Uh, because Blender's quite good at this, we don't have to worry too much about naming because most uh, parts of Blender don't rely on a naming of a file or an or entity within the scene. But you can vary up a bit, so making sure materials have MTL at the beginning, um, OBJs, collections. Uh, collections, we do actually want to make sure that we have a uh, standard naming scheme because we'll be in linking those later. Uh, oh yeah, I also gave it hair because I thought that's what all of the uh, YouTubers do. So uh, let's get in the groove of making assets. So you open the asset base, uh, save as immediately, and don't forget this. Um, I forgot it multiple times whilst making this, so I had to make it again. And uh, change the name of the main collection of, uh, to the asset name, and then start making. So we've got some assets. So now we're getting somewhere. Uh, but with the other assets, like the chair and the table, they need to be interact with, with, they need to be there for comp composition. So we can't really make them without looking. We need to sort of have a way of seeing what our assets look like laid out. Laid out. Layout. 
So now we have, even if we have the best storyboard and concept art in the world, some stuff will change in the translation. So let's say our uh, lay out our assets in a scene before going full animation mode uh, to see what they look like. And this is where uh, we open Blender again. Uh, we link in stuff that we've already made, like the, uh, the jam, uh, gym, and the plate. And do this by linking, not appending, so you get the library overrides, so you can actually interact with them. Uh, linking is preferred because it saves on file size, meaning we get to fill in one of those other quotas. And it speeds up the interaction with the scene a lot. So if you start making a very rough model of the room, the chairs, and tables, uh, we get proxies that we can have for uh, measuring the size, measuring the scale, how it's going to work with composition. And if you see that the scale is vastly off, uh, you can fix that in here as well. So we make a new version of those assets, um, relink them in, open the Blender file in the uh, scene hierarchy, and re relocate or just reload. And uh, I'm avoid avoiding trying to make this a linking tutorial, but this is just saying that versioning can work hand in hand with linking. So uh, we've got this, we don't need to worry about too much about cleanliness because this is more like the look dev step. So we'll make sure the render settings are all the same, but we don't need to be uh, checking all the names. Uh, we still want to check against the animatic and references, so keep those handy. Uh, here's where you'd also try out the camera angles and perspective. Even if you're making, uh, not only making any specific shot yet, you want to make sure that those look all right at this point. Uh, but it also means that we can uh, save this in the sequences folder as well, if we are relevant to some shots. So now we can finish all of our assets. So we take those proxies we made, import them into our assets base, and then start making some of these assets. And we can uh, reference in the same way with the other ones did. And now those assets are done, we can finally make our set. So now we have a new scene, new model, and uh, it's just the basic room. And we can link in our uh, chair and table assets. And then make sure that at this stage, the, the key thing to uh, check is the, uh, uh, the scene name itself, because we're actually going to be linking in the scene, not the collection. And uh, that, yeah, that, that's important because it helps change what things are. Also with the world lighting, if you're going to use um, set-related world lighting. So, uh, just like we did with the assets base file, uh, we can make a shot base file. So now we're done with the assets, we can start making uh, some shots to make use of those assets. So, uh, make a new Blender scene, minus the cube, and we can add our render settings. So, resolution FPS is good, but we can also set a render output path in the rough area we want. So right now, I don't think Blender could do string formatting inside the UI. So you can't really have it done automatically um, without just scripting. So that will be a manual step. Um, and But make sure you disable overwrite. We don't want to have to overwrite a render. We want to make sure that it's a separate thing. Uh, and it also stops the image extension being on the end of the file extension. We want it in the middle. Uh, and there's an important part of this is it's rendering as an image sequence, because image sequences are uh, the ideal form of rendering, because they let you pause pick up a render, download in batches, upload in batches, minuscule file compression when you're actually doing video export, and uh, they'll let you re-render re parts or maintaining the rest. But the only big downside is no audio. But they will come to audio again in, in a sec. Uh, we also want to set our frame range to star 1001. This is because we don't want to have some animation that if we want to have to extend a shot to have animation beforehand, we don't want to have to go into negative numbers because that makes it really hard to track what uh, frame numbers are going on, and if you have simulations, then you want to have those starting before the actual start of the frame range, so it doesn't just start playing. And uh, we want to enable those restriction toggles again. Uh, we want to keep collections uh, as well, neat and tidy, so we can have like simple um, camera rig, or uh, we can put in stuff like cameras or lights. And we can make a camera rig as well. So if you want to have a very simple camera rig, uh, this is just a few empties parented to each other with a camera on top. And this just helps um, make, make it easier to just get in and start animating once you actually open this file. Uh, and lastly, we link in our set. So if this is a base shot file for uh, a sequence, we, if we know that's going to be using the same set, we can link in that scene file. But we want to make sure that we put the scene file in this scenes box because that means that the scene is dropped in as a background. It's not interactable. It's not going to be uh, clickable, but it is going to be able to be rendered. And 
uh, provide all of the standard scene stuff that was in your set, uh, which also saves on a lot of space and time. It also makes it faster, I think. And then you could add in any assets on top of that as well. And uh, I know this feels like we've been preparing in like 10 different ways before we even start anything, but this is where it gets really speedy. So now I've got our full uh, base scene just there and ready. And save this, start animating. So all we have to do is now open that base scene, save as, link all or any relevant assets still remaining, and then just start working. Uh, you can use the edit as a reference to roughly set the um, start and end frame. Uh, you could do test viewport renders by just altering the output frame uh, output path a little bit to, to make it so it has the uh, like a token in it that says play blast or test render or something like that. Uh, and you can take advantages of shots being separate files now, so you can do stuff like parent uh, a plate to a hand so that the, the hand's not sliding around or the plate always goes with it, but you don't have to have that maintained between shots. Um, you can have like IK move between different places. Uh, you can break the rig so that the camera looks nice at one particular angle and don't have to worry about cleaning it up afterwards. Uh, or you can add 10,000 metaballs for an effect you wanted to do. And that doesn't uh, make any other scene slower. So lighting, that can also be done in the uh, uh, shot as well, but you can also add lights to a set so it links in. Uh, you can have most of the lighting happen after animation or whilst you're doing animation. This is also fairly free form. And uh, yeah, so we're doing a massive time skip now. This is where you have done all your animation, you've done all your lighting, and you're about to get to rendering. So now we can go through each shot and just hit render on them, and that will all automatically work fine, uh, except it never does. So the beauty of versioning means that you can make every new version a new shot. You can just have that be an entirely new, brilliant, brand new thing. And if you wanted to uh, try and do some automation or learn a little bit Python, then an automatic rendering uh, script would be a very, very good start. So now that we've rendered everything, we can import the newly made image sequences into a Blender scene and start arranging the shots. And you can play with the timing, you can make new shots, you can move them around, uh, versioning up, of course. And uh, now we get to audio. So audio, um, I didn't use that many, I didn't lip sync for this animation, but lip syncing is something that you'd absolutely need to handle with. But that means that you can also treat audio as something that can be a, uh, a shot specific file or an asset specific file. So if you have footsteps or Foley, that could be an asset that you drag and drop later and use multiple places. Or you can have a, uh, a very pivotal voice line that's specific to one shot be something within the shot. And uh, we also don't, so if we don't care about doing the, we don't, want, we don't want to have to worry about doing sound during animation. So if someone hits someone with a sword, we don't need to worry about a sword swipe. That is all handled in the editing. And so uh, unless it's a music video, you might want to uh, think about having music split up or working that into the shots as well. Uh, but that can also all be adjusted in the uh, editing stage if you have a bit of play between uh, in, uh, start frame and end frame. So once you've got all that timing down, that le leaves us with um, the final edit. And uh, um, yeah, and this also means that we avoid having to have uh, mob files that compress the audio once, and then we edit, and when we do an edit export, we compress it again. So this is what uh, I ended up with. This is the, the final animation. Um, play. Yep. So th this is um, a week or two of work whilst I was at work. Uh, the, the Just getting the pipeline ready to make this made it so much faster, and I was just able to get things going. I mean, it's, it's not uh, groundbreaking, incredible quality, but it, it works. There is audio, but I can't play that, and that's it. And so I've, I've skimmed over a lot. Uh, I've completely bypassed um, like steps as a folder. Uh, I've completely ignored compositing. I didn't even try to address plates or scans uh, because I wanted to just give an overview, a very short amount of time. Uh, plus, this brings up a point I wanted to make is that we need to uh, keep it simple, stupid, which is a mnemonic used in programming a lot, which is just to only do the things you need to do and not anything else. If you make a system more complicated, it actually makes uh, working in it uh, harder and makes it slower. 
So if you don't foresee yourself needing to work with vendors or uh, make Slack comps or do any other stuff like that, then you don't need to. You can assume that that's not going to happen. Um, but that being said, if you are at a studio and they do ask you to do something that you think is uh, unneeded or slows things down, then please do it, because likely uh, the pipeline know that it's bad and they're trying to work around an even bigger problem. And so here's all the times I ignored my own advice. Um, I forgot that I needed to animate the desk, so I had to make another set which had a desk missing, so I could port the desk as an asset and link that separate, uh, separately. Uh, I forgot the bread has slices, so I needed to remake that asset and I had to uh, import that back in. Um, I had to reversion it up because the parenting was gone and weird. Uh, I forgot my own name in convention. I couldn't remember if it was scenes or scene. And many more things that I'd probably forgotten. But the improvement you get over just attempting to do this is uh, far outweighed by the little mistakes you make. And the yeah, final message of this is that um, the, the only thing better than perfect is standard. And that's it. Uh.